Hey, thank you, Phoebe. Um, so welcome everyone uh, to tonight's talk, um, which is going to be practical Doppler echocardiography. Um, uh, and this is another one of these um, quests for the Holy Grail. Um, everyone seems to want to be able to do Doppler echocardiography. You know, show me how to do Doppler. Show me how to do Doppler. I want to know how to do it. So I think there's a reality check here um, for, for everyone, and that, that is that it takes time and it takes practice. Um, you need to be able to master the standard views, um, but then you have to learn how to manipulate these views to non-standard views so that you can actually opti optimize alignment with flow. I think you also need to understand the theory um, and you need to know how to adjust the machine settings. I think there's another reality, and that is that not all ultrasound machines are capable of um, performing well for echocardiography. Um, so you, you do need a machine that's capable of doing it as well. So here we go, Doppler echocardiography. Um, the, the Doppler principle was originally defined uh, by Christian Doppler, um, and this was the principle uh, that's still used um, for all types of Doppler imaging. So the sorts of Doppler imaging that we do these days would include color flow Doppler, power Doppler, pulsed wave Doppler, continuous wave Doppler, um, and tissue Doppler. So what's it all about? Um, it's based on this principle, and that is that, um, and it's to do with the Doppler shift. And that is that if you um, send a, a packet of um, uh, ultrasound or sound waves towards a stationary target, what you find is that the returning signal is the same frequency as the signal that you sent to the stationary target. However, if you um, send uh, some sound waves towards a moving target, so if the target's moving towards you or towards your probe, so the back would be the probe in this case, um, then what happens is that the reflected signal um, has a higher frequency and that's called the Doppler shift. Um, whereas an uh, alternative to that is that if the, um, the target is moving away from, um, from your, um, your Doppler probe, um, the frequency that is reflected is a lower frequency. So that's a, a different Doppler shift. And that's basically the principle that's used um, to look at blood flow um, within vessels, blood flowing away from the probe or towards the probe. So what does Doppler actually tell you? Um, so if I was doing a, um, a hunt for a murmur, so I've heard a murmur, I've got a young puppy, um, and I want to find out where that mur murmur is coming from, um, Doppler will tell me where the turbul turbulent flow is. It will tell me what the direction of flow is. So is it flowing towards the probe or away from the probe. So depending on your alignment, that may be, is it shunting left to right or right to left? Um, it will give me information on the character of the flow. So it will tell us whether you've got laminar flow. So, so that's where all the red blood cells accelerate at the same pace to a peak and then decelerate at the same pace. Um, or is it turbulent flow? So where it's completely chaotic uh, and flowing in all sorts of direction. Um, it will also tell you what the velocity or the speed of blood within that vessel is, so the velocity of the flow. Um, and it will also tell you or give you information on the pattern of the flow and the timing of the flow. And that's what you use ultimately to um, confirm your diagnosis. So here's, this is my rules before we start. Um, I would always say, if you're going to do color, uh, sorry, Doppler echocardiography, um, what I would say is you press the color flow button first, establish where the um, turbulence is or where the flow that you're interested in looking at is, then press the pulse wave Doppler uh, and do a pulse wave interrogation. Um, and then if the velocity is too high for your pulse wave Doppler to, um, to, to, to calculate, then um, I would press the continuous wave Doppler um, and that would be the last thing that you would do. But I would say always, always, always try to optimize your alignment with flow. This is absolutely crucial in um, Doppler echocardiography. You must be aligned with flow um, as accurately as you can possibly be. Because what we say is that if you're um, greater than 10, to, sorry, greater than 15 degrees out 
um, then you can actually underestimate the, the velocity. Um, and that is significant where um, prognosis is, uh, is dependent on the peak velocity um, through an area. So for example, aortic stenosis or pulmonic stenosis, um, the actual prognosis depends on, on that velocity. So it must be measured accurately. So I'm going to start with um, color flow Doppler. Um, and color flow Doppler uses pulse wave technology. Um, and what it does is it displays color coded blood flow velocity and direction, and that's superimposed onto your black and white image. Um, and the easy way to remember this is Bart. Here's Bart Simpson on the, the left here. Um, so BA, blue is um, away and red is towards. So that's where the BART comes from. If you can't remember that, then whenever you press your color flow um, button, um, this box comes up, this chart on the side. Um, uh, and what that shows is that anything going away from the probe is blue, blue, and anything, any blood flowing towards the probe is red. Um, and at higher velocities, the shades get brighter and brighter um, of either blue or um, red. Um, and turbulent flow tends to be uh, in a mosaic pattern, whereas um, laminar flow tends to be a, uh, all of the same sort of color. So here's an example here. This is a, um, an aortic outflow. This will play. There we are. So here's aortic outflow. Now, uh, except we don't have this properly aligned, but um, what you can see is that you've got a blue signal going through the aortic valve. Um, and it's pretty much all blue. Um, so that signifies blood that is moving in a general direction, which is away from the probe. It's heading that way, which is it's getting further and further and further away from the probe. So that's why that's encoded blue. So that's laminar flow. Whereas um, this one on the right hand side at the bottom um, is very much turbulent flow. So this is a dog with mitral regurgitation, severe mitral regurgitation. And you've got this mosaic effect that's created by the, the turbulence. Here's the mosaic here. So how do we go about doing color flow? Um, I think before you start, um, what I would suggest that you do if you haven't done this before, um, is have a look at what your cardiac preset looks like. So whenever you press the color flow button, the first thing to look at um, was, would be the velocity range that's set. So for cardiology, um, I would be thinking about setting that somewhere between 57 and 70 centimeters per second. Um, you'll find that a lot of abdominal imaging um, is, um, uh, is set, uh, the color flow Doppler side of things is set for a much lower velocity. So if you've got an abdominal preset, um, it might sit at 19 and that would be inappropriate for doing cardiology work. The next thing to think about is where the color gain um, is set. So if I just play this, what I do is I have the probe off the animal and I turn the gain right up and then I turn it down and down and down until that spontaneous speckling stops. And that's roughly where you should be um, with your color gain before you get started. The next thing is to make sure that you've got um, a good quality black and white image before you start. Because if you don't have a good quality black and white image, you can't expect the color flow image to be, to be any good. So um, it's got to be, a, as I say, a good quality uh, image and you're looking at precise alignment with flow. So here we have um, a left apical four chamber view um, and I'm interested in the mitral valve here, the mitral flow. Um, and what you can see is I'm staring right down the barrel of the mitral valve. So I could interrogate mitral inflow in this region here or mitral regurgitation, which would be flood, blood flowing um, through the valve the wrong way. But I've got really, really good alignment with flow. Um, if I was interested in looking at the tricuspid valve, then what I would want to do is take that image of the heart and rock my probe and bring the tricuspid valve to the center so that again, I'm optimizing my alignment with flow. Um, now, this is, uh, and, and just to labor the point, um, so this is what I said before, angles greater than 15 degrees are considered unacceptable. Now that doesn't matter quite so much for color flow Doppler, um, but you, you would get the best um, image um, if your color flow Doppler is, um, 
uh, sorry, if, if your alignment is perfect for, for cover flow Doppler. Um, where it is really counts is when you start to do pulsed wave or continuous wave Doppler when you're measuring velocities, because as I said before, you would underestimate if your angle is greater than 15 degrees. So that would be considered unacceptable. The other thing to think about is where your um, focal point is as well before you get started. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute. So the next thing I would do is press the color flow button and you get this sampling box that's produced. Um, now what I want to do is change or uh, alter the size of the sampling box and um, you don't want to make it too big because what that does is it slows the frame rate. Um, so you want it to be a nice size um, so that you, you get all the information that you need. And the other thing is that you can do with your sampling box, and you just saw me doing it there a minute ago, um, is that you can move your sampling box into the area that you're interested in sampling. So I just play this one again. You can adjust the size of the box, optimize that for the area you're interested in, and then you can move your sampling box all around. If I'm doing a hunt for um, a murmur, then this is the sort of thing that I might want to do, um, is look for the, the most obvious um, areas where we would expect to, uh, to have a shunt or uh, to have regurgitation. And so I would hunt around the heart that way by moving the color box. Um, so here's an example. Um, so this is my own dog um, that I did the other day. And so what we do is we get a good B mode image and then we press the color bu uh, box, color button. The box is too big in my opinion. So um, I'm changing the size of that box and optimizing it for mitral flow. And what you can see there is that she's got a little leaky mitral valve, small leak in the mitral valve there, that's the blue. Um, and the red that you can see, the other side of the valve here is normal laminar mitral inflow. So um, the other point I was making about the focal point is that your focal point wants to be in line with the area of interest. Now, in a lot of modern machines, whenever you press your color flow box, you'll find that the, um, the focal point sits exactly where your color flow box is. But with some of the older machines, um, what you used to have to do was you had, you had to press your color box and also just think about where your focal point is as well. So that's an important um, thing to consider uh, if you've got an older machine. So I'm just going to give you some examples of color flow Doppler. So here's, um, this is my dog. This is another one of her valves, um, which is leaky as well. Um, so what you can see there uh, is blue. Remember the BART thing, blue away, red towards. So blue is flow going that way um, down this artery. Um, and red, that you can see here, is blood heading towards the probe. So what you have is systolic um, flow and you've got diastolic um, flow. So, so there's a little bit of insufficiency in that valve there. But you can see that little red flame. So I'll just run through some examples just to get your eye in for this. So here's a, a normal aortic outflow. This is a right parasternal uh, long axis view um, and this is the outflow view. So what you can see is um, blood flowing away um, in a general direction uh, it's getting further and further away from the probe, so it, it, it's blue and it looks quite laminar. So here we have um, the same view again, um, but this one uh, has got aortic insufficiency. So that red that you can see is blood heading towards the probe, red towards, um, which represents aortic insufficiency. And you see what I've done in this case, I've taken this standard view here and I've tipped the heart up the way so that um, I, I can actually interrogate this because if the flow, um, if that flow was perpendicular to the, um, to the probe, um, then you're not going to get any useful information, directional information from your color flow Doppler. So this is a technique that we use in color flow Doppler to improve alignment with flow so that we can actually see what's going on. So here's a ventricular septal defect. So what can I see here? Um, so again, this is a right parasternal long axis view, um, but optimized for um, looking at the, the VSD, the hole in the heart. And the VSD is just in this position here in the septum, high up. Um, so what I can see is flow 
um, heading towards um, the probe uh, and it's in diastole it's red, in systole it's turbulent um, and you can also see um, some flow, some normal fl laminar flow going through the aortic outflow um, if you look closely, there is also some aortic insufficiency. So there's, there's a little blue jet coming from the aorta as well. So it's a VSD with some aortic insufficiency that you can see there. And then um, uh, one of the, the most common things that we see is mitral regurgitation. So the teleflow box is over the left atrium where we'd expect to see the regurgitation. And the jet's filling less than 30% of the left atrium. So we call that mild mitral regurgitation. Um, if the jet fills 30 to 70 percent of the left atrium we would call that moderate um, mitral regurgitation and if the jet fills greater than 70 percent of the left atrium then um, that would be classed as severe mitral regurgitation. Now what you have to bear in mind here is that all of that is dependent on the settings on your machine so if you set your color flow to gain too high um, you will mess this up um, and you will overestimate the, the, um, the regurgitation. So you, you have to be aware of the limitations of, uh, of trying to assess the severity of mitral regurgitation um, just by using color flow Doppler. Um, and uh, how do you actually assess the, um, the percent that the mitral regurg um, fills of the left atrium? Um, well, what I used to do with my, own, my old machine um, was I would measure the left atrial area measure the mitral regurg jet area and get the machine to calculate it for you. And so there's 24% in this case. So that was mitral regurgitation. Here's a bit of tricuspid regurgitation that you can see here, right parastermal long axis view, tricuspid valve is there, and there's some flow heading away and generally away from the probe. So it's blue and it's turbulent. Um, here's another one. So here's, um, a dog that has got severe de degenerative mitral valve disease, severe mitral valve prolapse. You can see severe tricuspid valve prolapse um, and you can see some tricuspid regurgitation and it's really quite marked. So my next question is, okay, there's a big tricuspid regurg jet there. Can I steer into that? Can I align with that flow? And can I actually measure the velocity? And that's what pulse wave Doppler is for, which we'll talk about tonight. Here's a tricuspid valve dysplasia. So this tricuspid valve is not meeting uh, in the middle at all. It's very dysplastic and abnormal. Um, big right atrium. Um, and with color flow on the top, you can see a big turbulent jet of regurgitation. So that's tricuspid valve dysplasia. So here's pulmonic stenosis. I think this is a tiny little puppy, uh, if I remember rightly, it's quite a few years ago. Um, but what you can see is a right parasternal short axis view. So this is the view here. Um, so it's optimizing the aorta, the pulmonic valve, the right ventricular outflow tract, um, and the pulmonary artery. So you can see there's a post stenotic dilation. Um, and um, if I play the video, you'll see um, that it's narrowed around the pulmonic valve and the pulmonic valve is actually prolapsing as well. Little wriggly pups and um, so it's having a little wriggle for us there. And here's the color flow. So what can I see in color flow Doppler? I can see turbulence going through the stenosis um, uh, but I can also see some pulmonic insufficiency. So there's a little jet that you can see heading up that way as well. So you've got turbulence in that direction which is pul uh, the pulmonic stenosis and there is also pulmonic insufficiency. I'll just play that again so that you can see that. Um, so here's a, another um, pulmonic, steno sorry, pulmonic insufficiency this is. Um, so this is a dog who had a PDA. And so with the PDA, we'll discuss this um, as we're going through cases here. Um, but with PDA, you get blood flow um, that, that heads towards the valve and that can result in some um, pulmonic insufficiency. So, and this is pulmonic insufficiency here that you can see. So it's um, coded red, blue away red towards. Um, so blood flowing through the valve in the wrong direction. Um, and here is an actual PDA. So um, again, right parasternal short axis view, aorta's in the middle, um, right ventricular outflow tract, um, and uh, pulmonic valve is just here. So what you can see with a PDA is that there's no turbulence before the valve, 
that there's continuous um, chaotic turbulence in the pulmonary artery. And that's because you've got flow coming from the PDA heading the wrong way up the pulmonary artery. Um, and that's meeting blood heading the correct way through the pulmonic valve into the pulmonary artery. And you get this chaotic turbulence. So here's what a PDA looks like. So chaotic turbulence in the main pulmonary artery. So once I see that, um, my next question is, well, A, can I see where the, the, the ductus arteriosus is? Um, and B, I would, I'm looking for a continuous wave Doppler through that to see the, the, the classic um, uh, sawtooth prof profile that you get with the, with the PDA. Um, so here's some normal tricuspid flow. So you can also see tricuspid flow. Uh, inflow from uh, the right parasternal shot axis view as well. So that's normal flow. And then same view, this is a bit of tricuspid regurgitation. So tricuspid valve, aorta, right ventricular outflow tracts, you've got blue cozy blood and um, heading the wrong way through the valve. Okay, so um, there's another view that you can use um, and that's really useful for getting good alignment with a PDA. So this is a normal um, normal view um, and this is a left cranial oblique view so um, it's a short axis view taken from the left hand side um, quite far forward um, and with extreme dorsal angulation um, and what you see in this view is the, the pulmonic valve sits here and this is a good view down you get good alignment with um, the pulmonary artery in this case so this is normal pulmonic flow so you can see the pulmonic valve just here and you can see blue laminar flow heading through the pulmonic valve the right way. So that view is a really useful view for, for looking at a PDA. So let's just um, recap on, on what happens in a PDA. So basically you've got a patent ductus arteriosus. So you can see it here, you can also see it here. Um, uh, and it's a connection between the aorta, the high pressure circuit and the pulmonary artery. Um, and what happens is um, blood is ejected from the left ventricle into the aorta. Um, so this is at high pressure. We've got an opening between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. So blood squirts through the, the ductus arteriosus uh, and it heads the wrong way down the pulmonary artery towards the pulmonic valve. So this is why you get this flow, um, uh, what we call retrograde flow within the pulmonary artery. So it's heading that way continuously but it's also heading against blood coming through from the right ventricular outflow tract towards um, and through the pulmonic valve, the right way through the pulmonary artery. Um, and this is actually why you get such a dilated um, pulmonary artery with a PDA. Um, so if we just look at this, if I um, cut into the pulmonary artery here, and um, what you can see is the, uh, the ostium of the PDA. Um, so that, that would be heading towards the, um, the aorta. Um, so blood flows out of the, the PDA ostium from the aorta into the pulmonary artery and it heads down towards the pulmonic valve, the wrong way down the, the pulmonary artery. Looking at that from the other end, so this is the aorta that's opened. So this is the other end of the ductus, so this is the wider end. So if I look down that hole there, that would take me down towards the um, PDA ostium uh, and towards the pulmonary artery. So if that all makes sense, then um, if I show you then what a PDA looks like, so this is that left cranial oblique view that I talked about before. And remember the normal one, it looks um, nice and blue laminar flow. Um, so the pul pulmonic valve is here, the pulmonary artery is heading down this way, and the PDA ostium is just at, at that point there. Um, so the PDA ostium um, is, uh, is where the blood is coming from through the aorta um, towards the, uh, the pulmonary artery. So you get this continuous turbulent flow because the aorta in systole and diastole is at a, a higher pressure than, than the, uh, the, the pulmonary artery. Um, so this is what you get. So that's classic PDA. And what you can see is that you get good alignment. I can stare right down into that flow um, with my... Uh, pulse wave Doppler, or in this case, it's at much higher velocity, so continuous wave Doppler, and um, to give me the, the classic signal that you would see, or the classic spectral Doppler profile that you would see. So here it is here again. So just to try and uh, illustrate the point, there's the ostium, um, which is here. 
here's the pulmonic valve um, in the top left. Um, and so you've got PDA flow or ductal flow heading towards the uh, pulmonic valve. Uh, and that's going against the, the normal flow that's coming out of the pulmonary artery. So if I was to summarize color flow Doppler um, and optimizing your image for color flow Doppler, what I would say is that, um, and I didn't mention this before actually, um, if you use a lower frequency probe, um, that will give you better color flow Doppler, especially with bigger uh, patients. Um, uh, but it's be again better for high velocity flow as well. So what you would want to uh, attempt to do is optimize alignment with, with your flow, optimize your color gain, um, reduce your black and white gain actually. If you feel that, that your color flow Doppler is just not quite vibrant enough, if you reduce your black and white um, gain a little bit uh, and make the whole image darker, sometimes that brings the color up and makes it a bit more vibrant as well. Make sure your focus is on the area of interest. Um, if you have an old machine and it's struggling um, to cope with uh, all the information coming from your color flow Doppler, you can actually reduce the sector width as well. And that reduces the amount of uh, information that the, the computer has to deal with. Um, in modern day machines, you don't really have to think about that at all these days. But certainly minimizing the sampling box size um, will help. Um, you to, to see things um, better, I would say. Uh, and then at the end, I've always said this, um, you have to understand the limitations of pulsed wave technology. So color wave, so color flow Doppler is, um, is a form of pulsed wave um, Doppler. And um, so it suffers from the limitations of pulsed wave Doppler and it suffers from aliasing. And we'll talk about aliasing when we talk about um, pulsed wave Doppler. So here is pulsed wave Doppler. Um, so when you press your pulse wave Doppler, so in the, the image that we can see here, um, I've got my color box already um, activated. Um, I've decided where the um, turbulent flow is and I've decided that's what I want to sample. So then I press the pulse wave Doppler and then I want to steer the pulse wave Doppler um, sample volume. We call this the sample volume here. Um, we want to place that uh, in the area of interest. Um, and when you place that over an area of interest, it only records the movement um, in that little box that you can see there. It doesn't record anything else. So it tells you what's happening specifically in that area. Um, and you can move that up and down um, so that you can, you can actually decide where flow is coming from. Um, so, what happens is that you get um, pulse, some, some pulse wave uh, signals or, or ultrasound waves um, are emitted. So it's a pulse of them. Um, and then a pulse is received um, before another um, uh, pulse is, is emitted. So that's what pulse wave Doppler is. Um, and when you do that, you get a spectral Doppler display that's produced. And this is what it looks like. So this is a spectral Doppler display. What does it actually tell us? Um, what it tells us, uh, if you look at the baseline here, there's a baseline there and there's a baseline here. So any flow um, below the baseline represents flow away from the probe. Whereas any flow above the baseline is to flow towards the probe. So in this case, um, this is the uh, this is pulmonary arterial flow. Um, so what you have is a right parasternal uh, short axis view optimizing the the pulmonary artery. So we're actually measuring the, uh, the flow through the pulmonary artery. So we'd expect it to be um, heading away from the probe. So it's below the line. Um, so what else can we say or what else does it tell us? It also tells us that the flow is laminar because we've got a nice crisp envelope. Um, so it's a hollow tracing. And that means that all the red blood cells are accelerating to a peak and then they're decelerating back to zero. Um, and if we read along the scale here, we can actually um, say that the velocity um, is roughly, I've guessed it there, 100 centimeters per second. So it's flow away from the probe at 100 centimeters per second and it's laminar. So that, that's um, pulmonary arterial flow. Um, this is mitral inflow. So this is um, a left apical four chamber view that you can see here. Um, and so you've got flow heading towards or through the mitral valve the, 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 the right way. 
Um, so it's the left atrium to the left ventricle. So that's why you get flow above the line. Um, and it's 80 centimeters per second, roughly. That's the E wave. Um, and it's heading towards the probe and its lamina. So what's the usefulness of pulse wave Doppler? Um, so it gives, as we said before, uh, it gives uh, information on flow velocity within the sample. It gives us the direction. So above the line is um, towards the probe, below the line is away from the probe. Um, it gives us information on the character of the flow. So um, if it's lamina, you get this hollow tracing. Uh, whereas if it's turbulent, um, you get uh, the whole tracing is filled in. Um, so that's an important thing to, to be able to understand as well. But it does have its limitations. So um, pulse wave Doppler uh, is only useful for measuring um, lower velocities, you know, maybe up to two to three meters per second. Um, it's also limited by the depth, so the depth that you're, um, you're interrogating. So the deeper that you go, um, the lower the velocity that can be sampled. And if that velocity does exceed what we call the Nyquist limit of the machine settings, then we get something called aliasing that occurs. And when aliasing occurs, um, we can't get any directional information um, that can be derived from that. What do I mean by that? Um, so here's some aliasing here. So this is a mitral regurge jet um, taken from a right parasternal long axis view. So there's left atrium here, left ventricle there, and this is a mitral regurge. So I know that the jet from a mitral regurge would normally be um, five to six meters per second. So I know that um, pulse wave Doppler is not going to be able to measure that um, accurately. And so what happens is when the, you get this um, uh, wrapping round of the display uh, in both sides of the line, that is aliasing that you can see. Um, and I suppose aliasing um, also represents turbulence. Um, if you have a flow that is between two and three meters per second um, and you, you're getting aliasing, um, uh, there are ways around it. Um, so you can, if you, you can enable high, um, what's it called again? High pulse repetition frequency. Um, uh, that, that enables interrogation of, of higher velocities or just, just by increasing the scale, um, you can interrogate higher velocities. So um, to optimize your pulse wave Doppler image, um, again, a lower frequency probe will allow you to interrogate higher velocities. And use your color flow to steer into the area of interest, just like we talked about. Optimize your alignment with flow. Um, we need to think about being within 15 degrees um, uh, of the, the actual um, flow alignment. Um, and then the next thing to do is move your baseline up or down, depending on whether the flow is towards the probe or away from the probe. So that would be your first thing to do. Um, and then change the scale or increase the, um, the pulse repetition frequency um, if your velocity is too high or if your sample volume is too deep into the tissues. Um, and then once you've got um, uh, your, your spectral display, um, you can just optimize your Doppler gain um, or your pulse wave Doppler gain, and that just cleans up the, the image quality as well. Um, so here's a, an example. So this is Nell again. This is her tricuspid valve this time. Um, so tricuspid valve, we've got our color flow on. We've got good alignment. You can see there's a little tricuspid regurge jet there. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do, we've seen it, we're going to line up with it. That alignment's pretty good. There's a pulse wave Doppler um, sample volume there. And then I've pressed um, the acquire. And so what we've got at first is aliasing. So the first thing we do is take the baseline up to see if that corrects it. And it hasn't quite. So what I've done is I've increased the, um, uh, the scale. And by increasing the scale and moving the baseline up, we've now got a signal that we can interrogate. So it's flow away from um, the probe. So it's flow in that direction, it's blue. Um, we can tell what the velocity is, it's at two meters per second. Um, and obviously you would normally actually measure that with the machine, do a calculation on the machine. Um, but what else can we say about that? Um, we don't have a nice clean envelope here. Um, we don't have a hollow envelope. So that is actually turbulent flow that you can see. And it's turbulent because it's blood squirting the wrong way through the tricuspid valve. Okay, so we'll look at some normal pulsed wave Doppler envelopes. 
So mitral inflow, so a top left image um, is where you would um, do your mitral inflow and interrogate your mitral valve. Um, so what you want to do is um, position your sample volume uh, between or at the tips of the mitral valve cusps um, and your spectral display will look something like this. So you have an E wave and you have an A wave. E wave represents passive diastolic filling of the left ventricle, whereas the A wave represents the atrial kick that comes um, after atrial systole. Um, and if you look at the ECG at the bottom, um, what causes that A wave is the P wave. So it's the electrical activation of the atria um, and atrial contraction that causes that A wave. So you have an E wave and an A wave with mitral inflow. It should be laminar. Um, and what I'm interested in is measuring the E wave velocity and the A wave velocity. And I tend to look at the deceleration time as well. So what's the significance of um, abnormal mitral inflow? Um, an elevated E wave velocity, so this one here, um, is seen uh, and it can be associated with volume overload or um, elevated filling pressures. Um, an E wave velocity greater than 1.5 meters per second suggests elevated filling pressures um, and an increased risk of decompensation of death in dogs with mitral valve disease. And the reference for that is, uh, is at the bottom. That's a nice paper to read, actually. Um, so um, other bits of significance for mitral inflow. Altered flow profiles can be associated with relaxation abnormalities um, or I've put mitral valve dysplasia as an example. Um, but this applies, I suppose, more to cats with diastolic dysfunction. And what you find is that the, um, the profiles change as you get progressively more severe diastolic dysfunction. So you have a normal E and A wave, um, whereas with uh, the early diastolic dysfunction, you get a relaxation abnormality. So the A wave becomes taller than the E wave. Um, as that progresses to become more severe, you get a correction. Um, so the E and A wave look normal, and that's what we call pseudonormalization. Um, and then with very severe restrictive um, cases, then you get a very tall E wave and a small A wave. Um, so that would be a, um, a restrictive physiology that we get with that. Um, other things that's useful with the mitral inflow um, is the E to iso isovolumetric relaxation time. Um, well, I haven't even written it properly, is E to isovolumetric relaxation time, the E to IVR to U ratio. Um, and if that is increased, it can be predictive for congestive heart failure. Um, and there's a, a nice reference to that in uh, JSAP 2009. Uh, tricuspid flow uh, has normal, has E, e and A waves as well. Um, so we're interested in the E and the A wave velocity. And again, it should be laminar. What about pulmonic outflow? Um, well, with pulmonic outflow, what you're wanting to do is position the sample volume just beyond the pulmonic um, valve uh, in the pul pulmonic trunk. Um, and and inter interestingly, in this one here, um, I haven't actually got my sample volume in uh, the, the pulmonary artery, um, it's just at the pulmonic valve. And the reason for that is that I'm actually sampling um, the regurgitation that's going on in this case. Um, so anyway, what you do is you optimize alignment with flow, the same, as, uh, same principle as we've talked about, and use your color flow to guide you in first. Uh, a normal pulmonic outflow would be V-shaped and it would be laminar. Um, and what you'd want to do is measure the peak velocity and normal should be up to 1.5 meters per second. Um, so this here, as I said before, flow above the line is pulmonic insufficiency. And so just measuring that. So that's, that's turbulent flow as well. It's not laminar flow. This is laminar flow uh, in the coming the right way through the pulmonic valve. Um, so aortic outflow uh, can be measured from the left apical or the subcostal windows. I tend to find that the subcostal window um, gives you a more accurate um, alignment with flow. Um, so I tend to use that one, although I measure both uh, in every case. Um, so aortic outflow tends to be dagger in shape, you know, dagger shaped. Um, and again, you're looking for laminar flow and with a normal up to 1.7 meters per second. So that just gives you a flavor of um, pulse wave Doppler uh, and the kind of normal um, profiles that you would expect to see. 
So let's talk about continuous wave Doppler. So this would be the, the third part of your Doppler examination. Um, so with continuous wave Doppler, what you get is ultrasound um, waves are continuously emitted and received at the same time um, and from all points along that line. Okay, so it's not like pulse wave Doppler where you're measuring just within a, a very small sample volume. It's everything along that line. Um, now what that does is it allows you to sample high velocity jets. Um, so, you know, if you get five, uh, five, six or seven meters per second jet, um, then uh, you, you, your continuous wave Doppler will allow you to measure that and measure it accurately. Um, it doesn't actually give you inf any um, reliable information on the character of the flow, I wouldn't say. Um, and the other thing to be careful of is uh, be aware of the limitations. So if you steer into an another area of flow, um, uh, you can actually sample flow that you weren't intending to sample. So for example, um, if I was sampling aortic outflow, you have to be careful that you don't um, drive into mitral regurgitation at the same time if you're sampling from the, the left side. Um, what I would say is always um, uh, optimize your alignment, just as we said before, um, so that you, you don't underestimate your velocity and you're looking at taking the maximal velocity reading. So this uh, that you can see here is a, a pulmonic stenosis case and we're looking at the, the peak velocity, the maximal velocity. So here's some examples. Um, here's a continuous wave Doppler assessment of tricuspid regurgitation. So here's your tricuspid regurg jet. Um, and notice with continuous wave Doppler, you don't have an envelope. Um, it's always filled in like that. Um, so here you have a tricuspid regurg jet and it's less than three meters per second. So um, that would not be compatible with pulmonary hypertension uh, if you've got good alignment with flow. Here's a continuous wave Doppler uh, of a pulmonic stenosis. So I've, I've lined up with the flow um, and we've got a peak velocity of what um, 4.6 meters per second. Um, and that equates to a pressure gradient. If you've heard of the modified Bernoulli equation, uh, it's um, the pressure gradient equals four times the velocity squared, 4b squared. Um, and that gives you the, the peak pressure gradient. So um, we've got a, a, a fairly severe pulmonic stenosis going on there. And then this is a, a mitral regurg jet. So we're just measuring the jet of uh, flow, the velocity of flow from the left ventricle to the left atrium. Because of the pressure difference between the left ventricle and the left atrium, I would expect it to be somewhere between five and six meters per second, um, as you can see there. And then I'll finish off just with um, PDA flow. Um, because that produces a classic sawtooth profile. So um, I, we, we looked at um, the color flow um, examples of PDA flow. Um, you can interrogate PDA flow and you get this sort of sawtooth profile and it's quite spectacular to see. So this is continuous systolic and diastolic um, uh, ebbing and uh, uh, you can see the flow here actually increasing, decreasing. Uh, and, and that maps the, the, what the murmur sounds like. The murmur sounds a little bit like this. Um, that's your classic machinery murmur. That's what, what it looks like on a spectral Doppler um, profile. So if I summarize what we've talked about tonight um, in our little run through, um, the golden rules for Doppler uh, echocardiography would be you choose um, the correct probe frequency for the size of the patient, just bear that in mind. A lower frequency probe will probably give you better Doppler. Um, always, always, always optimize alignment with flow. So that means taking standard views um, and moving the heart across so that you can line up as perfectly as you possibly can with alignment with flow. Um, optimize your color gain and your black and white gain. Um, and then what I would say is use your color first to identify the area of interest, so to identify where the murmur is coming from. And then once you've identified that, line up your pulse wave Doppler. Um, then um, uh, if you start to interrogate the area, if you get aliasing, change your baseline, increase your baseline, uh, or drop the baseline down um, to see if you can um, stop the aliasing. If not, then increase the pulse repetition frequency or the scale. 
uh, and see if you can catch it that way. Um, if you still can't um, measure the velocity, then uh, what I would say then at that point is change to continuous wave Doppler and see if the continuous wave Doppler can, um, can accurately um, give you an idea of the, the velocity. So um, use pulse wave, pulse wave Doppler to look at low velocity and laminar flow and use continuous wave Doppler to measure high velocity um, and or turbulent flow um, and really understand the limitations of each Doppler type. And that's us done. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. That was brilliant. Thank you very, very much, Mark. Um, we've got uh, just a couple of questions. How do you change the sampling box? Um, but has then clarified and said, actually, can we, would you mind just having a little chat about the knobology of Doppler in general? Um, I feel like that might be a whole other presentation. <laughs> uh, it, it is. Um, so the sampling box, I tried to do that in, in one of the, the videos here, and it depends on the machine uh, uh, as to how you actually go about changing your sampling box size. So we're talking about color flow Doppler, I'm assuming here. Yeah. Um, so um, you can see on, on this one size and position um, uh, on this machine. So this is the, uh, the, the P50, the Sonoscape P50 that you can, that's been used on, on this demonstration. Um, so you use your tracker ball um, and the, the buttons that are to the left and the right of your tracker ball. Um, so you press the change. So what you do is you you press this button and then use your tracker ball to uh, to increase or decrease the size. So to the left and right, um, it makes it wider um, and up and down makes it longer. And then if you press your, the change button again, that then allows you to toggle to, to just moving your box um, around, the, um, around the area of interest. Um, with other machines, it's a slightly different um, way of doing it. Sometimes it's an update button that you that you press, um, they're all different. So you, you would probably have to just look at the manual to see how to do it. Some machines are more intuitive than others. Some machines you can go to and it just works. You don't have to think about it. Others you're left kind of thinking, ah, um, where is that button that I need to press? But when, once you get it into your head, it's not that, it's not that difficult. Um, it's just knowing how to do it. So that was that. What was the other question, sorry? Uh, yeah, just gen the general knobology of Doppler, um, but yeah, I suppose as you said, the, that will depend on the machine. It does depend. It does depend on the machine. I mean, I've I've tried to to talk about some of the the buttons, the important buttons. So when you're talking about doing color flow, um, I think your gain setting is important. Getting that right at the beginning. Uh, and also making sure that the velocity range is appropriate to the area that you're uh, you're interrogating. So this um, 57 to 70 is a ballpark sort of figure um, that I, I would be looking for um, in terms of your, your view range. Um, and then, you know, some some machines really struggle to uh, to to get really vibrant color flow Doppler. So you have to drive these machines very hard. Um, so as I say, if you take your color gain up a little bit, but you don't want too much spontaneous speckling. Um, if you're still not finding it's just quite vibrant enough, then take your black and white gain um, and, and take that down a, a notch or two. I think that can be really useful as well. Um, it makes it more vibrant. And then again, uh, in some of the older machines, um, you can take your sector width and drop that down. Um, and you generally use your tracker ball to do that. There's some settings that allows you to, to take your sector width down. That, that means that your machine's got less computing to do. So um, it means that the frame rate um, can be higher um, and the, the clarity of the, the image is better as well. With modern machines these days, you don't have to think about that at all, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say. 